Hello, everyone. I'm Carol Sutton Lewis, founder of Ground Control Parenting and a Common Sense Advisory Council member. I'm also the mom of three children, now all in their 20s. I'm thrilled to be here for this timely discussion about the intersection of social health, social media, and mental health. I'm guessing that many of you are here today because Instagram and Facebook have been in the news lately, specifically around issues of our children's mental health, especially our girls. We know that's a troubling topic, so we're here to drill down into the data, offer, offer common sense as practical tips for parents and educators on this topic, and to consider the positive uses of these platforms. So first, let me introduce our great panelists. First, we have Victoria Garrick. Victoria is a former Pac-12 champion. She's a TED Talk speaker, a social media influencer with over 2 million followers online. She first began sharing her story of how she battled and overcame depression and anxiety in her 2017 TED Talk, The Hidden Opponent, which has been viewed over 370,000 times. It's amazing. Victoria has been featured in the New York Times, People Magazine, USA Today College, and is a host of No Filter Podcast, Real Pod. Next, we have Dr. Dolly Glock, who is a board certified family medicine physician, uh, mom of two teens, and the founder of Adolescence, a resource on puberty, child and adolescent health and development, and parenting through it all. Based in Los Angeles, Dolly has over 20 years experience helping families connect over tricky topics, and she believes the best preventive medicine is delivered through effective health education. Our final panelist is Dr. Danielle Ramo. She's a clinical psychologist, researcher, writer, speaker, and chief clinical officer of Be Me Health. Danielle ran the research on addiction and digital intervention lab as professor of psychiatry at UCSF designing and evaluating interventions delivered through social media. At BME, she is helping to design a digital mental health solution for teens. Danielle is based in San Francisco and is mom to three soon to be adolescents. Welcome to the panel, Victoria, Dolly, and Danielle. Thank you, happy to be here. Thank you. Oh, good, glad to have you all here. So we begin with the news of whistleblower Francis Haugen's revealing Facebook's internal research about Instagram's potentially harmful effect on mental health, especially when it comes to teen girls and body image. According to Instagram, 22 million American teens use this platform every day, and 40% of Instagram users are 22 years old or younger. So that's a lot of potential harm. But we also want to think about this pop topic in terms of all social media, not just Instagram, uh, all the platforms, including TikTok, Snapchat, how they influence our kids' mental health negatively and positively, and how our children's focus on creating and consuming all of this content impacts how they form their sense of self. Danielle, I'll start with you. You've done a lot of research and writing around social media and mental health. Can you please unpack this all for us, uh, starting with the documents revealed by the whistleblower last month? Sure, Carol, thanks so much. I can certainly try to unpack all of this. It's something I think about all the time. Um, so let's start with the whistleblower and what actually was unpacked. On September 14th, the Wall Street Journal broke a story of internal research at Instagram, showing that the platform was toxic to teen girls. And soon after that, Frances Haugen, the whistleblower you mentioned, claimed that Facebook purposefully hid this research because it showed that teen girls felt worse about themselves after using its products. So there's kind of two things here. One is what exactly did that research show? And the other is what more broadly do we know about uh, research in this area? So the research itself internal to Instagram examined the relationship between Facebook use, body image issues, and other kinds of mental health expressions in teens. And it showed that one in three teens in one study reported that Instagram made their body image issues worse. 
So yes, that's concerning. Uh, it is about a third of teens. So uh, that means the rest of the sample either showed that uh, it didn't impact them or that it might have made them feel better. So it's not saying that all teens who use this platform will necessarily have a negative mental health effect. But there were some other things the study found as well, including that among teens who had suicidal thoughts, 13% in the UK and 6% in the US said that they could trace those thoughts directly back to Instagram. So is this a good thing? No. Is it a red flag? Yes, for some teens. But this is only one study. And um, looking at kind of the broader area of research in this area, one key concern I have as a researcher is that most of this work is correlational, not causal. So it looks at patterns of teens using social media over time and then looks at patterns of all different kinds of mental health effects. If we really wanted to know whether Instagram or other platforms were actually causing mental health harms, we'd have to randomize teens to either use Instagram, not use Instagram, and then look at the direct effects on a whole host of social media outcomes. And to be totally honest, those studies just really haven't been done so much. Um, what I've been doing in my work is uh, for the past 10 years or so, looking at the relationship between social media use and mental health. Primarily what I've been looking at is the delivery of interventions that we already know work in other contexts, contexts like a therapeutic relationship. If a teen went to a mental health counselor at their school, for example, we know how to help them make healthy behavior changes or address symptoms of depression and anxiety. So a lot of my work looked at if we transform those interventions and adapt them for delivery on social media, will it actually improve their lives? And uh, in short, it does look like delivering positive content, supportive content, that we know works in other settings can impact positively the mental health of teens. So that's just the other side of the coin here. What this means is that we shouldn't broadly vilify social media per se, but that it's very clear that for some teens, it can have really dangerous effects. And yet for others, um, or depending on the strategies and what content is delivered via social media, there might be some positive effects as well. Boy, that, that's, that's really good to hear. A quick question about the business of the social media world. Can you just talk a little bit about the algorithms? I mean, we've heard that word, but can you explain how they uh, maximize user engagement and how, how, what Instagram and what all these platforms really focus on? Well, certainly. I mean, I, I am not an expert in the AI algorithms that uh, platforms like Facebook use, but I can say that at their core, social media companies are businesses motivated by profits. And their goals are to get as many users as they can and to keep those users on their platforms for as long as they can to maximize advertising dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So the artificial intelligence algorithms that they use to feed us all content are the things that they believe will generate generate the highest amount of engagement. And so that is not necessarily or inherently meant to improve our lives, uh, to, to support things like depression or anxiety and making us feel better. They want to make us feel better in the moment in order so that we'll come back to the platforms. Um, but what it also means is that they're maximizing and taking advantage of what we know neurobiologically supports engagement. And that is the small dopamine hit that we get every time we're, you know, scrolling through a newsfeed and see something that is appealing to us. And so the algorithms are based on the ability to maximize the dopamine hit we all get, and uh, that will make us more likely to come back. Now, for teens, that uh, that, that set of algorithms might be uh, yield a more stronger effect. So um, teens might be more susceptible to dopamine responses to digital content, and they might be more affected by some of the content that is either positive or negative compared to uh, older adults or middle-aged adults whose brains are fully developed. And I should say, you know, we are talking about social media in particular, but the teen susceptibility to the neurobiological reactions of digital media are relevant beyond just social media. So it's there for video games, for VR, and for other kinds of digital content. Danielle, that's, that's really helpful and good for parents to know. So let's get back to the positive aspects that you've talked about, the positive aspects of, of what's on the screen, not the dopamine. <laughs> Tell me, um, you worked, Common Sense worked with uh, Hope Lab, which is a research organization. 
to study how pe young people were using the mental, using social media to help with their mental health during the pandemic. And, and there were some positive consequences. Can, can you, since you worked with Hope Lab on that research, can you talk a little bit about the positive things that happened or what the research showed? Yes, of course. So before I joined Beamy Health, I was uh, a senior director of research at Hope Lab. It's a social innovation lab that makes behavior change tech to support teen health. And we also support research, including a survey that we collaborated with Common Sense Media on, as you mentioned. And in 2018, we surveyed over 1,400 young people throughout the United States. And then we did so again in 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. So last year's survey was 1,500 uh, teens aged 14 to 20 years old throughout the United States. And, you know, I, I'll be honest, Carol, there were both positive and, as you might imagine, also some negative effects that we, we saw during the survey because we were, frankly, surveying teens during the pandemic. So, for example, we saw that depression and anxiety were indeed on the rise among teens in the U.S. So to give you a sense, 38% uh, of teens said they were experiencing heavy amounts of depression and anxiety in 2020 compared to a quarter in 2018. So, you know, we're, we weren't surprised to see that teens were affected by the pandemic and that their mental health was generally taking a hit last year. Um, but as as you mentioned, there was a real promise of digital social worlds to support teens, especially last year during the pandemic. So teens were overwhelmingly telling us that they were going online to find mental health support, many of whom were able to get it in that way. So they weren't able necessarily to connect with their friends in person, of course, or even um, therapeutic support or other trusted adults, but they were connecting with friends online. They were able to uh, express themselves online, many of whom were not able to do that in places like school or other social settings. And they were able to see others who were like them, who were experiencing the same kinds of distress that they were. Um, the other thing that we saw was that not all social media interactions were the same. So um, the teens, especially who were telling us that they had high levels of depression or anxiety symptoms, were able to get the most out of their social media connections when they were making more meaningful and deeper connections. So doing things like DMs with peers who were, you know, doing something in a verbal way, actually sending personal messages back and forth to friends, for example. Um, you know, when people in general just sit and doom scroll, we know that that's not great for mental health. And teens who were depressed or anxious told us that they took a particularly big hit if that was the way that they were interacting with social media. Um, but if they made deeper connections, more meaningful connections, and if they did things that we actually know relates to the science of happiness, things like um, talking about what they were grateful for, um, expressing gratitude for things in their lives, uh, reaching out to a friend when they were struggling. Those things were directly associated with helping them feel better on social media. So there really was some good promise when, when teens used social media in a way that was what I like to call quali quality rather than quantity. Thanks, Daniel. And that's a perfect segue to Victoria, because you have used Instagram and TikTok to message directly to kids about body image and, and mental health. So let me ask you, you're so involved in this. Straight up, do you think that Instagram and, and other social media platforms can be bad for mental health? So it's a, it's a tricky question, and I want to be careful with my answer, because I think that the common misconception is that social media itself is inherently bad. And it gets this notion that social media is bad. You shouldn't use Instagram. You shouldn't use TikTok. Let's just cancel it all. When really, I think the deeper answer is the way in which we use social media can be bad or can be good, can have a poor effect on our mental health, can have a positive effect on our mental health. And I think with young kids, especially, and this happened with myself as well, when I first got on the platform, I wasn't aware, you know, you know, like in life, you develop a certain sense of self-awareness. It's like when you're 10 and the YMCA comes on and you go dance it because you don't care what people think. And then somewhere down the line, you think, oh my gosh, but I'm not a good dancer. What are they going to think of me? It's similar with social media. When you first get on, you're not really aware of what you're consuming, how it makes you feel. You're just following anything. You're a kid in a candy store. As you get older, you develop that self-awareness, but sometimes it takes even longer to really think, how does this content make me feel? 
do these people actually inspire me to be a better version of myself, to feel confident in who I am? Or do the people that I follow actually make me feel like I'm never good enough or, you know, that I'm not pretty enough. And it took me being 18, 19 years old to finally look at my social media, both how I was portraying myself and what I was consuming to realize I haven't been using this in a healthy way at all. And that's what caused a big shift in me and is the message I like to promote and try to get others to recognize that at a younger age. So I think social media itself is not bad. The way in which we use it can be bad. And that's why I really like to put an emphasis um, and help kids understand what they're doing when they choose to press that follow button or that subscribe button. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. So I love how you have used social media first as a megaphone to tell people about your, how you overcame depression and anxiety and therefore um, letting people who had similar feelings or connect to you. But you also encourage people to be real critical thinkers by revealing, pulling the curtain back and kind of revealing how people use the images and the content to give impressions that aren't really true. So, so can we talk a little bit about how, I mean, basically you're using social media to talk about how complicated social media can be. And can you talk about the, the benefits of that? And, and if there are any downsides of that, like, do you have to be really careful with your messages? I, so to provide, you're correct. And to provide even more context for anyone viewing at home who, you know, has never stumbled across my pages, I do something called hashtag real post. And it's sort of a reveal of you know, what really went into getting the perfect bikini photo or what really was happening on the day that you thought everything was amazing because people say social media is a highlight reel. And it is, I had a best friend call me recently. I'm on this trip with these people. There's so much drama. I'm having the worst time. What do you know on Sunday? Best trip with the girls post the photo on Instagram. And and that's what everyone sees, right? So Mm -hmm. that is something that is never going to happen on my page. Um, And I like to say that my little corner of the internet on Instagram is always going to be revealing what I really look like, what I'm really thinking. I never filter or Photoshop anything. And it's unique, right? Because yes, I am on a platform exposing how people misuse the platform. But I think that that little dose of reality is important. It's a little reminder every single day that you can't trust anything that you're seeing online and you really do have to take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. Now I have to say, I, I had the pleasure of scrolling through your posts and it was helpful to me. I mean, I think parents out there should take a look at it as well. Thank <laughs> you. It's really good. Um, you, you talked about this a little bit. If you could just expand a little bit more on how you age, how kids aging on social media, because they become more sophisticated. So what would you say about, um, when they're really young on social media, how can parents sort of help? We'll get more to tips in a minute, but just generally speaking, how how do you see the arc of of development and and how can parents know when their children are gonna be more critically savvy? For sure, and before I even answer, I wanna acknowledge I don't have any kids. I have no idea what it's like to be a parent. So I hope all you parents right now don't think I'm about to tell you how to raise your kids. <laughs> Not at all. However, I can, from the perspective of being a kid and the experience of being a kid, I can say that I think the way in which you help them cultivate their relationship with social media can be a game changer. For example, instead of like, you're not going to use Instagram or I want to see who you're following or give me your phone back. It's leading them to the answer. So who do you follow? Why do you like these people? What do they post about? Cool. What do you learn from them? And just, you know, give them those questions and, and get them to start thinking about, oh, well, I follow Kylie Jenner. And then you say, oh, why? And they, and they start to say, oh, well, you know, because, and then, then maybe they figure out that it's not really for the best reason. So I think when you are, using, I mean, you have your own relationship with your kids and then they have a relationship with social media and you're trying to help them. I would in the best way, get them critical thinking by the way you are talking to them about the social media that they're using. Instead of creating those rules, they're never really going to put the pieces together of, of how it can be harmful. And in the long run, they're the person that, you know, needs to create that decision or needs to start making that decision for themselves and as they will for the rest of their lives. So I think, you know, as your kids are aging and they're starting to develop their own awareness and think about things, you can definitely be someone who is kind of like leading them in the direction that, you know, you know, is going to be healthiest for them. 
Well, Victoria, for somebody who doesn't have any children, that was a pretty savvy parenting advice. <laughs> I would agree. <Agreed>. <laughs> I would just add, as someone who's had children go through this, that that was really smart advice about asking your kids to tell you who they follow. Really, parents try to keep a poker face and try to not be judgmental because the last thing your child's going to want is for you to sort of say, oh, no, why are you following that person? Really, just try, just gather information. Just take a and breath. And guess what? We're going to want to follow that person more. So... <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks so much. So now let's turn to Dr. Dolly to help us understand where kids are physically and emotionally as they start diving into social media. What are they going through and how does this relate to their online experience? Well, they're going through a lot. And by the way, I am a parent and I'm still not here to tell you all how to parent. So, <laughs> but yes, I mean, let's talk about sort of that developmental framework, because I think for parents, when we're talking about any kind of behavior around teens and tweens, whether it's online or in real life, it is really helpful to have that developmental framework. So physically, right, when we're talking about tweens and teens, their bodies are changing right before their eyes. They're going through puberty. And if their own bodies aren't changing quite yet, their peers' bodies are. So kids start thinking more about their physical appearance and they start comparing themselves to other all the while they're getting these very powerful messages from around them about beauty and masculinity and about diet culture. And I know we're all concerned because of the recent news about Instagram's effects on body image. Um, but I just want to make the point that this is not just an Instagram issue or just a social media issue, right? They're also getting messages from TV and movies and games and billboards. And, and we also can't ignore the very powerful messages our kids are getting from the people that are closest to them sometimes, you know, maybe, maybe it's from their parents or siblings or peers who are saying things about their own bodies. All of this impacts our kids' body image at this sensitive time in their development. And then along with puberty comes budding sexual development and more curiosity about sex and sexuality. And when kids have questions, where do they go? They go online for answers. So we have to remember as parents that their interest and their curiosity is absolutely developmentally appropriate. What they encounter online, however, may be wildly age inappropriate or at the minimum, not quite what they bargained for during their, their Google search. So this is when I get the calls from parents because their elementary schooler encountered porn online or because there was a sexting scandal in middle school or high school. So understanding that all that changing and that curiosity is typical at this age is a really important step for parents in empowering themselves to sort of to parent proactively in the digital space and to really think about what conversations we need to be having before we hand over that very first device or maybe years after we hand it over that device. It's never too late to, to have those conversations at home. And then in terms of their social and emotional development, you know, adolescents start pulling away from their parents or they're establishing themselves as independent beings. And, and at the same time, their peers take on increased importance. And there's a real evolutionary drive for that connection with peers and for trying to fit in. And, and this is part of what is driving them to social media or even to gaming with their friends, right? So we look at them and we think, they're so addicted to their devices, but really in many cases, what they're so hungry for is that connection. And of course, we also need to keep in mind their adolescent brain development, which I could talk about for an hour, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to say, you know, tweens and teens will make emotional, feel good, reactive, impulsive choices. So they may have an emotional outburst because they witnessed on Snapchat in real time the goings on at the party they weren't invited to, or they may impulsively send out a text or a photo that they immediately regret, but now it's out there for the world to say, see. So this is because of where they are in their adolescent brain development. So teens will make mistakes. So what are some of the conversations we can have proactively about potential pitfalls or ways to pause? And then when they do mess up, how can we support them as parents? And how do we react as communities in those moments? Do we turn our backs on the kids that made those mistakes or do we figure out ways to come together for teachable moments? Hmm. So I really like this concept of parenting proactively. And to me, it's got lots of different levels. I mean, 
you, you talked about the conversations we need to have with our children. Um, one of them being the, that content never really goes away in that <laughs> the, the, my, my mother used to say, never write anything down you don't want to see in the cover of the New York Times. On the first page. <laughs> and so while I, I didn't subscribe to that fully, the concept is that what you post, you post forever. <laughs> and, and so it seems that that would be one of the conversations. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about parents, how parents um, need to think about their own approach to social media as they proactively parent, don't they have to kind of look to themselves to see how they use social media? I have this, this uh, spectrum I like to think of as parents with an ostrich at one end, and that's the parent that they don't want to know about any kind of social media. They, they've heard of it. They want to have nothing to do with it. They think it's, it's scary and they don't know how to access it. And so they'd much rather keep their heads buried in the sand and sort of assume that their 12 year old isn't focused or that, that there's nothing they can do about it. And then, but at the other end of the spectrum is the peacock who, is, who loves social media and in fact uses it for themselves in ways probably that they would not want their children to do, you know, sort of uh, all sorts of, um, content that they might be concerned about their child doing. So, of course, nobody wants to be at either end, but, but how, how can parents realize where they are on that spectrum and what should they do in, in terms of how they talk to their kids about social media? Right. Well, I mean, I think you're so right that parents are all over the place in terms of that spectrum. And so we do need to take some time to, you know, take a good, long, hard look in the mirror and see where we are. And I find that parents really have a lot of anxiety around kids and, and tech. And it's so understandable. Also, anxiety is not a great place from which to parent effectively. So the more we can do to try to leave the fear at the door and leave the anxiety at the door and find ways to be tech positive, the more successful we'll be in communicating with our kids as we, as we establish, establish those limits. Tech positive. I like that. <laughs> I wonder too, Dolly, if you would also frame it as tech realistic. Mm. You know, it's so easy for parents to go to a place of tech ne negativity and fear and anxiety drives us toward that. And yet that's so unhelpful for our teens, right? That's absolutely right. And sort of trying to be more neutral. I mean, I get a lot. Do you want to talk, Carol, about, you know, screen time and, and thoughts oh, around yeah. those limits? Actually, I'm just heading right there because um, parents, we want to focus on parents' roles um, and what parent, everybody wants to know. What kinds of age and screen time limits? How should we set them? What should we be setting? I mean, we know the common sense media, which we both are on the advisory council, really focuses on this, but truly, what can you say to parents about what kind of limits to set? All right, so everyone wants a hard and fast rule about screen time, but we all know that not all screen time was created equally, right? So there are really positive, productive, connective, creative ways to spend time online, and then there are more problematic ways. So you all are the parents, you get to make the rules, and if things aren't going well, you also get to hit the reset button. I just wanna say a lot of parents are hitting the reset button right now because they loosen the rules, myself included, during those dark days of the pandemic. And now that we're in this new phase of the pandemic that feels a little bit more like normal, we're all here together just trying to like figure out how to get the toothpaste back in the tube. So it is not easy. I'm still making adjustments with my own, my own team. So first I wanna just take a moment because I know we have some parents of the younger tweens who maybe haven't quite set their kids loose with these devices, right? And so before you hand over that first device or you consider letting them go on social media for the first time, I always suggest, you know, considering the child you have in front of you, are they responsible in real life? Are they impulsive or do they, do they feed off social drama? Do they, do they like to stir the pot? Or maybe they're super sensitive when the social situations don't go their way. So you can expect all of that to play out similarly or even be accentuated online. So maybe they're not ready yet and you want to delay. So you can use COPA laws to your advantage. And those of you who don't know what that is, COPA stands for the Childhood Online Privacy Protection Act. And that is a law that prohibits platforms from collecting data on users that are younger than the age of 13. So you can honestly tell your kids that there's a law that says they're not supposed to be on social media before the age of 13. And creating community with like-minded parents 
really, really helps around this. Um, there's also all these new devices now that are not smartphones, but dumb phones that are actually uh, very sleek and cool looking like Gab or Pinwheel. These are a couple examples and they have all that functionality of calling and texting that parents want maybe for security reasons, but they don't give kids 24 seven access to the World Wide Web. Um, and then Common Use Media has wonderful uh, media use agreements, so I would really recommend looking into that. Okay, but for all of the rest of you who are like, okay, that ship sailed a long time ago. My kid has their face buried deep, deep, deep in their phone, and I want to set better limits. I would say, you know, a really important place to start is thinking about sleep. This is a health issue, right? Getting adequate sleep is important for our immune system, our metabolism, our learning, our emotional regulation, so much more. And our kids are just not getting enough sleep. So tweens should be getting nine to 12 hours of sleep a night. Teens should be getting eight to 10. I know sometimes it's easier said than done, but our kids are um, not getting enough sleep and devices are part of the issue. And it's not just the blue light. It's also because they're literally sleeping with their devices under their pillows or on their nightstand next to them. And their sleep is interrupted by all those notifications or they're stimulated by the gaming right before bedtime or the digital drama that they witnessed on social media right before bedtime. So this is why as physicians, we recommend everyone get off their devices at least an hour before bedtime and charge them outside of the bedroom. This goes for parents too. buy an alarm clock. You don't need your phone in your room. Um, and then, you know, considering other device free times and places in your family room for device free meals, car rides. So these are other ways of placing limits just by, you know, limiting for, for health. Um, and then multitasking and distractions is another really important thing that, and I hear a lot from parents about that. Teens especially think they're so good at multitasking, but our brains are designed such that we cannot do two cognitively complex tasks simultaneously. We're task switching and that comes at the price of efficiency. So this is why sometimes teens complain their homework's taking forever. Well, maybe it's because they're doing their homework while they're also snapping and gaming with someone all at the same time. So having those conversations, talking about where you struggle yourself with your work, talking about things like turning off notifications. We don't need to know about every single news alert or snap or DM coming in in real time. Turn that stuff off and then check in when it works for you, right? Put, put away your phones when you're on your computer for school. Um, but most of all, I think we do need to come back to your point earlier, Carol, we need to think about what we ourselves as the adults are modeling in terms of our own screen use. And we need to think in terms of mentoring our kids online, because as they get older, we want our teens to be able to come up with their own solutions. So our title today may be control the scroll, but with teens, we want them to learn to control their own scrolling and to be mindful of what is and isn't working for them. And as Victoria talked about, which friends and social media accounts, you know, make them feel good about themselves. When do they need to take a digital break? Because by the time they head off to college or the real world, we want them to be able to manage their devices and their time on their own. Wow, that, that's great. And, and this is great because you're already segueing into this next section, which is, um, I want to, we all know, we build this conversation as controlling the scroll. And so we want to make sure that parents leave with a lot of good, a good sense of how they can help their kids manage consumption, be protected from harm, and understand how to use social media in the most beneficial and responsible ways. So panelists, I'm going to open this up to all of you guys. Um, what are your takeaway for parents? Give us some, you've been giving great tips all along the way, but give us some more tips about how to open up these important conversations and instill a strong sense of media literacy and critical thinking in children. And Victoria, your, put your tips in. We wanna hear from you as much as from, from the people who have children. So um, Danielle, let me, um, uh, uh, who should I start with? Victoria, let me start with you. Why don't you talk about oh, sure. what kids can do, what, what parents can tell their kids to do to stay safe? You know, as I'm listening to all of this, it's fascinating because when I was in high school, we just got Snapchat. So, you know, I, I didn't have this experience that these kids have now. However, I see the difference when I coach a volleyball clinic and none of the kids are talking to each other. Like, I'm like, okay, everyone get on the line and we're going to start warmups. And they don't talk to each other because 
they are so used, like it's, they're way more awkward than how I was when I was in sixth grade and we were all talking and, you know, meeting strangers. And so, it, you know, it's, it's fascinating. I will say trust is a huge thing. I think trusting your kid and then your kid feeling like they can trust you. And I think something my parents did that helped me a lot in high school, you know, when like, um, Dolly was mentioning, you know, when you start to get crushes and things start to get a little more serious, you know, there can really start to be a divide between you and your parents um, social media included, because now it's this whole portal for secrecy. I think allowing your kids like some independence so that they feel comfortable sharing that with you. Like, you know, if if I told my parents, I'm going to go here and this is what we're doing. And, um, you know, this is exactly the situation. These are my friends are coming and I want to stay till nine 30. And my parents were like, okay, you know, because you told us exactly what you were doing and that this is going to be fun for you. And we'll pick you up at nine 30, as opposed to me feeling like I have to lie that this person's going to be there. And then my parents say, well, then I'm going to get you at eight o'clock. And then I'm upset with them and they don't trust me. I think trust in general is a really great thing to develop with young kids too, because we sometimes feel like we're smarter than our parents think that we are, even though we don't know everything and we're going to make mistakes. I think it is easy to remember when you were 15, 14, 16 years old. And like, you did feel like you, 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 you knew what you were doing, even though you didn't. Does that make sense? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to ask um, Danielle and, and, and Dolly to hop in here. But before I do, I just want to remind the audience that we're going to go a little bit over. We're going to go 15 minutes over. So please stay with us. So Dolly, Danielle, let, let's hear some, some more um, ideas about what parents could be doing. Sure. Sure. And Dolly, you threw out a lot of great tips. And Victoria, I love the framing on teens today are just a little bit different than even, you know, you were as a teen. And for those of us who are parents of teens, in my case, almost teens, uh, you know, it's entirely different in some ways. And I think a lot of us would be shocked, just like you are with the way that uh, teens social worlds are so different from what we might be comfortable with. But to be honest, honest, the framing around social media use can be kind of similar to the framing around the natural adolescent experience of prioritizing their friend lives uh, a little bit more and prioritizing their family lives a little bit less uh, during the teen years, which Dolly highlighted is very normal and actually quite healthy during the adolescent years. So, you know, I encourage parents to be realistic about that. It's not abnormal these days for teens to be prioritizing their social lives. And a lot of their social lives are happening online and via social media. So it's not always social media. I just want to highlight again that, you know, video games or discord or other kinds of um, digital worlds that teens are involved in are also part of this experience. But whatever it is that your teen is using or however they're connecting to others online, it's really important that parents are realistic that that is really meaningful and important to them. And actually to the extent that whatever pattern your teens are exhibiting, we are those people that they can go to when there are challenges, that is the best thing that we can create in the home. So we don't always know when those things are going to arise, but just like uh, some some, you know, a teen in high school has a negative social interaction in class or, or outside or, you know, on the volleyball court or whatever it is. And you would want them to be able to come home and tell you about it and, you know, cry with you and be there for them. It's the same on social media. So to the extent that you can have open conversations in the home about what challenges might happen and, you know, make sure your teens feel comfortable coming to you when there are those challenges, that's ideal. The other thing is that there is positive education out there and a lot of information available as others have highlighted about how to use social media in the most healthy way. So I mentioned some, you know, differences between what I call quality interactions and and just quantity and just taking in things like a newsfeed and scrolling or following accounts that might be negative. You know, there is a real clear difference between uh, interactions that are what I would call healthy, supportive, can improve our well being, and ones that aren't so good. And so you can have open conversations uh, with you know, in the home about what those differences are. I always like to encourage families to try to figure out that what 
that research shows themselves. So teens are often really interested and curious about how social media affects their mental health and are very happy, honestly, to Google research studies and, and what we actually know is out there in the area. Um, and, you know, this, this is the case with substance use as well. I get a lot of questions about um, teen uh, neurobiology and effects of substances because I talk a lot about addiction in adolescence. And it's the same idea. Teens always want to know, you know, what are the effects of drugs and alcohol on the adolescent brain? They want to go out and find the studies themselves. So the same is true with social media. So to the extent that parents can have open conversations about, gee, I don't know what a really healthy or effective way of interacting is. Let's go figure it out. But why don't you figure it out and let's talk about it. You know, that, that seems to really spark positive interactions more than not. Yeah, I agree. I love, I love the idea. You know, I'm all about conversations at home. I think that is absolutely huge. And, and I think again, the more that we can um, leave that anxiety behind when we're interacting with our kids and find fun ways to engage with them online and meet them with curiosity and treat them like the tech experts that they are, right? So ask questions rather than lecturing, plop down on the couch next to them, ask them to show you who the popular TikTokers are, who the YouTubers are, right? You will get a lot of information if you ask questions about what it is that they're engaging with, what, you know, what kind of content they're consuming. And then once they've let you in their world, then you can sort of start chipping away, talking about your values and helping them to develop, develop that critical lens. I also think that sometimes you know, as parents, we get so caught up and so worried about all this stuff. And when we do have these conversations, your teens might tell you stuff that makes you feel a lot better. Like I was just, when the news came out about the Facebook's internal research on Instagram and its effect on body image, I immediately, like I use that as a teachable moment to talk with my daughter. I've talked with her friends about it. And what I find is so cool is a, they already know that this was no surprise for them that, you know, Instagram might make body image worse for people. And we had this really cool conversation about different platforms that they're on and ways that they have figured out to be more authentic, like how they feel more authentic on Snapchat, that people are more themselves or, or how they love to FaceTime with their friends. It's the, to me, that's, that's like having a conversation, right? They're getting that feedback from one another. And so I just feel like human nature wins out in the end and we are social beings. And so we need to think about this as part of this conversation as well. Mm -hmm. Victoria? Yeah, I have, a, I have a thought that just occurred to me because I'm like, I'm like, where can I contribute here? Um, but I think something really specific that I think some parents can relate to is not only are our kids consuming content, but they're creating it. And there are young people who are gaining thousands of followers on a TikTok video on an Instagram. And I think for any parents who have kids that are like, I want to be a YouTube blogger. I want to post more on my TikTok and they're starting to really create. I just wanted to add that like, it is a really unique way to express yourself and be a director and a producer with this little TikTok video and dance. And I think, you know, if you have kids that are really excited about creating content. Like I had a mom come to me and say, you know, my 14 year old wants to do YouTube channel, but I don't want her to get all these negative comments. So the compromise was you can create your videos. This is awesome, but we're going to turn off comments so that strangers on the internet can't come and, and troll her. Um, however, I would just say like, if any of you have kids who are really interested and captivated by the, uh, the idea of creating, it is a really cool path. There's tons of opportunity there. And, um, I know it's harder for like, especially even my parents are like, what do you do for a living? I'm like, yes, it's my phone, but you know, there really is some great opportunity there. So if you do have kids who are creative and they're really into it, I think it can be a cool thing to, to help foster that. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's so great. And Victoria, you're highlighting just one other really important piece about social media creation and a movement that I'm seeing happening all the time that you are so clearly part of and thank you for it, which is um, the importance of being authentic online and in social media. So, you know, we talked about um, the, the algorithms inherent in keeping users engaged in social media. And a lot of them are based upon our ability to create these curated lives that aren't real, right? And your example of the vacation was really part of that. And yet I notice a huge thing that you espouse on social media is that this is your real and totally authentic self. I think a lot of us, you know, even those of us who are more exposed to images 
images in you know, magazines and on television. We didn't even have that when we were growing up. So to the extent that that's a real opportunity now for teens to see real people in their real lives experiencing you know, the, the pleasure and pain of life uh, online, you know, they, this is actually going to be a really positive thing in the end if it's done well, which is like reducing stigma around mental health issues, talking about things like depression and anxiety, sharing openly that you know human suffering is part of all of our experience it's okay you will get through it and you know that's we're really lucky that our kids have access to that kind of content too so yeah no, that, that's great so the great tips great conversation i'm going to now move to some questions that we've gotten from our audience members some really good ones and i'm going to start with one about that that is really important to think about how do you set rules in your house if uh, if other home if in the homes of other if your your children's friends have different rules in their house or if you have a two parent uh, two separate parent homes where one parent has one perspective and the other parent has another on on digital social media and digital media use I'll I'll take the first hit I mean I think this is so <laughs> common right I mean I and this is part of parenting is this is not just around the tech world. Like you are going to have different rules in your families and other people around drinking or substance use or, you know, curfews, or this is just another piece of that. And so I think when parents struggle with that, I always encourage them to take a moment, put the actual issue aside, you know, think about their why, what is it that they, what is the boundary that they want to create and why? As a physician, I get to come at this from the perspective of health and safety. That's why it's easy for me to talk to teens about these topics, just like Danielle, same, same idea. Like they want to learn the science behind it. What's happening in their brains, right? What's happening in their bodies? But parents can do the same thing, right? It's, it's a security thing, a safety issue, right? Be clear on your why, be clear on your own values, and then approach the parenting from that perspective. And a lot is going to depend on the age. You know, when they're younger kids, it's going to be easier to have those hard, fast rules as they become older teenagers. You're going to need to involve them a lot more in that, in that decision making and creating those boundaries and having some compromises and some, some back and forth. But this is this is just the reality of parenting. It's hard sometimes. It's not always easy. Thanks, Dolly. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Well, I have some vivid memories coming back because my family was probably the more loosey goosey, trust the kids mentality. And my best friend's family was very much like what they ate, how their hair was done, you know, very strict. And I remember this funny memory of my best friend was like driving in the car with her parents. And she was like, oh, Taco Bell, I want to go there. And her dad was like, how do you know what that is? And she was like, oh, <laughs> Mrs. Garrick took me. Um, and so that's like one of our funny memories. And, you know, I think, I, and, and she's awesome. And, and, you know, it becomes a joke as you get up, oh, my dad will let me have a sleepover, but I'll see you at school. So, you know, I think the way that it manifests itself is, is different. I will say, and this is just a hot take. I don't have any clinical background on this, but you guys can let me know. The people I do know that grew up with like very straight and narrow rules always when the, when the arrow is pulled so far back in one direction, it just slingshots into another one as soon as they can make their own choices in life. So I do think once again, that trust that, you know, I do have some rules, but okay, maybe I will let you do X, Y, Z so that we can have a relationship where you feel like, you know, there's a little bit something there. I don't know. That's just like my perspective of thinking of friends from hometown. Is there, is there backing to that? What do you guys think? Am I wrong? Tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I agree. I find, especially with um, tech use and social media, I have just in anecdotally noticed that sometimes it's the parents that are really, really strict that have the kids who kind of go underground with this stuff, right? So they're still engaging, but the parents think they're not. And so now you're missing the opportunity to have those conversations. At right. Home. Like they're going to find a way they're going to use yeah. their friend's phone at recess. They're going to check something at school on the computer. So ra rather, you know, and you can watch over it. <laughs> that's exactly right. I agree. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's a huge reason why I talk about the need to just be realistic, like social media, technology, video games. It's it's all here. It's all deeply embedded in our teens' lives. The uh, desire to have it not here by some parents, unfortunately, is just not 
reality and it's not going to be uh, the ideal way to support our teams. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. So here's another question, Justin. So, you know, Victoria, you talked about the fact that in, in sixth grade, you remember everybody chit chatting online and really knowing how to interact with one another. And now you see that kids are losing the ability to just commute to interact with human beings. So if they're not, if teens aren't interacting in person because they're interacting more on social media, everyone, what can parents do to help our children develop better social skills? Because they still need them. <laughs> how can we talk to them about how to interact with other people? I'd be happy to start with that one because when I was at Hope Lab, we worked on an app to address the high rate of loneliness among college students today. The app was called Nod, and it was a very interesting challenge because we were working on a product that would be a place where teens could be individually, learn skills about uh, how to make more social connections and then go out in the real world and use those skills. We, we hoped not need to stay in the app because if it worked well, they would be able to go out and connect in person and uh, really meet their social goals. And we noticed from talking to a lot of teens that honestly, there were a lot of challenges in how to make new friends, how to connect with people in their classes and things like that. So, you know, if you walk into, let's say, a, uh, a, a cafeteria in a new school, which a lot of kids did this year for the first time when they started new schools, I'll, most other kids have their faces and phones. And how is it, you know, it doesn't feel welcoming or comfortable to connect with people in the way that life was before those phones existed. So, you know, we all have to work a little bit harder to be able to make connections, especially when we're in new environments. And having open conversations about that is a really important thing that can happen in the home. So a lot of uh, young people are starting entirely new schools this year. And uh, almost everyone at, you know, went through a whole different social developmental stage when they went back to school after a year away. So, you know, that is going to cause a lot of anxiety for teens of all ages and just having a conversation about what it's like to go to new classes, how um, teens can connect with people in classes after class, et cetera, you know, what kinds of connections they're having outside of the more formal organized things like classes and, you know, just recognize recognizing and validating that there are going to be some challenges and, you know, asking teens what they would like to try and how they think that they would put themselves in a new situation given, you know, or how they would handle the stressors of dealing with new situations because they will absolutely happen. Get them to come up with some of the answers themselves. Don't feed it to them. <laughs> That's really great. I got a quick, quick question. I'm going to try to do a lightning round because we need to wrap up, but it's a really important question of FOMO. FOMO, the fear of missing out that all the social media can really create. And a lot of parents have been asking about how to help their children deal with this. What's your best quick advice on how to help your kids um, deal with the social comparison and FOMO issues? What can you say when they say to you, why am I missing out on everything? Victoria, let me ask yeah, you. <laughs> I mean, it's a very real thing. I actually think one of the positives of the pandemic was you didn't have FOMO because no one was doing anything. And that was like a really big relief was, you know, that, that, that wasn't happening. I think to have FOMO, you have to know you're missing out and to know you're missing out, you're scrolling. So I think if you have your kids saying, oh, I'm not going to these events, my life, blah, 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 blah. You know, that's when you add that question. Oh, well, what's making you feel that way? And they say, well, on, on phone and on my phone, I saw these pictures. And then, you know, you can say, well, you know, just like we take a Christmas card picture, but we know the, our brothers were yelling at each other. You know, what you see online is a highlight reel. So I think that's another opportunity for a conversation. And I think time away from social media does really help with FOMO, at least personally. And so I think saying, well, why don't we try today? We don't go on our phones and we're going to go walk the dog or we're going to go do this. And then we'll check back in at, later today and see how your FOMO is. And then maybe they realize themselves that that was caused by social media. <laughs> wow. Victoria, the non-parent among us, giving us the best advice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> best advice for FOMO. <laughs> really appreciate that. Well, we have come to the um, end of our time together. Um, Danielle, did you, there was something that you just wanted to quickly share? 
Yes, I just wanted to mention quickly that um, the new startup that I just joined called Be Me Health has a podcast where a child psychiatrist, Neha Chowdhury, talks directly to teens about their online experiences and mental health. So if folks are interested in listening to that podcast, they can do so wherever they listen to podcasts. It's called Being Me. And if um, any teens who are listening or whose families are listening are interested in sharing their perspective on the online worlds and mental health with us, please email tab, T-A-B, at beamehealth.com and someone from our teen advisory board would be happy to talk to you a bit more. Thanks so much. Thanks, Danielle. Panelists, this was really great. Thank you so much. Each of you had such really wonderful things to say and I'm sure our listeners agree. And, and to our listeners, thank you all for tuning into this webinar to hear how about how you can handle these really tricky issues in your lives and, and help your children. I hope that we provided some really practical guidance and that you'll continue to consult Common Sense Media for resources and answers about raising kids in today's media rich world. Thank you all for coming. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. <laughs>